Oppo Tease is a rollable smartphone, and more coming up on today's episode of the latest in tech news. Hey Gadgeteer, you're just in time for the latest episode of the world's fastest growing show on tech and gadget news. That's right, this is the latest in tech news. My name is Taylor Merrick, and uh, you guys dig in the new intro? I have to get used to it. You see, I had a thought. And a lot of it was due to a poll that I put out uh, last week in regards to people wondering, hey, what are you tuning in for? Are you tuning in for the tech news, more of the gadgets, or gaming? And you want to know who won out? Tech and gadgets. Nothing to do with gaming. Apparently gaming is some kind of thing I have an interest in. Apparently tech news, gadget, people think it's tech news and gadgets. So that's what we'll be focusing on. Um, from here on out. Now, that being said, I do understand some of you like getting gaming news. And with that, I have an announcement. Yes, a second podcast will be coming within the next month. I'm I'm foreseeing that will be strictly gaming related, where me and a couple of people will be hopping on our Discord server recording an episode just talking about the latest gaming news or, 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 or games that we've been playing and enjoying or not enjoying or or we want to get or flush down the toilet for that matter. So, yeah, um, it's, it's the end of an era after 228 episodes. Well, if you guys are just tuning in, you're like, what the heck, 228 episodes? Yeah. Uh, 228 episodes, you heard me right. That's how many episodes there are of this, and it's been heard in over 100 countries around the world. So uh, this podcast has only been around for a couple of years, so we're, we're slightly changing gears. We're just letting the gaming side go off and start its own show. I hope to have some announcements on that shortly in terms of how to get the show, what it's going to be about, the name of the show, who's going to be on it, and... If a random listener wants to be a guest on said gaming podcast. So details will be coming forthwith. But with that being said, I know that you're here to tune in for tech news, gadget news. I got a good lineup today, so stay tuned. Our feature story will be kicking off with uh, Oppo teasing a rollable phone with a retractable display this is where it gets interesting see it's not lg that's going for it it's oppo of all smartphone manufacturers but we'll be getting into that shortly here we'll also be taking a look at amazon employees arrested for stealing five hundred ninety-two thousand dollars worth of iphones i couldn't believe it myself um but i figured i might as well touch on this story um otherwise i'll get yelled at because he'd be like oh you're not covering anything tech or or gadget related well, the, apparently stuff goes on, so I got to keep you up, up to date with that. So uh, don't do it. Um, clearly, it do, crime doesn't pay. We'll also be taking a look at Google debuting a new barely blue limited edition color for the Pixel 4a. We'll also be taking a look at a uh, new video game research offering a twist. Although I, I, I like how they're somewhat intentionally vague with the title. You'll understand why once you read the story and, and, and once I uh, am able to expound on my thoughts. I I mean, honestly. Uh, we'll also be taking a look at Android and iPhones are all about privacy, but a startup, Osam, looks to change all of that. Um, yes, we're hopping right back into the whole privacy, not privacy debate uh, in regards to your data that you have apparently out there on the web that people want to sell good, bad, or otherwise, we'll be jumping right back into that conversation again. We'll also be taking a look at the claim that the MacBook Air is faster than 98% of PC laptops. Well, I think somebody debunked it already. You have to wait to listen in to find out why. And finally, we'll be taking a look at some new sound beaming technology, claiming that it can broadcast music directly to your brain. But uh, before we get into that, just want to do a quick shout out for those of you just tuning in to listen. 
If you enjoy today's show, hey, be sure to give us a like if you're watching via YouTube or a subscribe if you're listening via the podcast. And uh, if you're a longtime listener or you've been listening long enough, be sure to share today's episode with a friend. So with that being said, let's hop on over to today's feature story. Yes, I know. Big wind up because I had stuff going on today and announcements to make. So I'm excited to be back in the hot seat recording another episode for you guys. Just strictly chilling and talking tech and gadgets. Now, a rollable phone is coming tomorrow, but it's not from LG. And if you're listening to this episode in the future, you're like, well, that was old news. Well, this is breaking as of right now. Apple's upcoming Eno Day tech event is a platform for the company to showcase its new wares and tech that we'll eventually see in future products. Last week, the Chinese phone maker teased a new AR glass wearable that it plans to announce at the November 17th event. Now, Apple has teased another Eno Day product that might just steal the limelight from LG. That being a rollable phone. The company took to Weibo and Twitter to tease a new phone with a retractable display. They said, big screen, small screen, infinite screen. In the future, your mobile phone may be able to retract freely. Reads the Weibo post. The machine translated, obviously. Um, the teaser is accompanied by an image that shows a curved corner and a display stretching out of the phone's chassis. The same concept phone image was used on Twitter, with Apple claiming that the device will usher in a new era of screen. Interesting. Here's the English version of it. Uh, Apple hasn't revealed much else, but by the looks of it, it might be a prototype or concept phone, like what TCL showed off earlier this year. LG is also rumored to be working on a similar rollable phone, but could Apple beat LG to the punch as far as commercialization is concerned? Not clear just yet, but LG previously teased the rollable phone design at the wing launch, and rumors point to a March 2021 launch. Yes, this is coming a lot sooner than we expected. We hope Apple shows off a working device and also gives us a glimpse of how the software would adapt to rollable screens. The future of phones sure looks flexible, and Apple seems to be in the thick of it. Can't wait to see what's in store now. What are you guys thinking? Are you looking forward to a rollable phone? And it's it's an interesting concept. Will they be able to get this to market before March 2021st? 2021, sorry. I'm thinking... I mean, imagine this. In the 80s and 90s, we had a brick for a phone. And then Nokia came out with, like, the indestructible phone um, that was a smaller brick, but still somewhat of a brick. And then Steve Jobs came out with the iPhone. And then everything went flat. And now, now... We're finally getting into the fun stuff. Like, what exactly can you do with a flat screen and a smaller device? Can you fold it? Can you retractable screen, roll it, uh, infinite screen? I don't know. It's This is where it gets cool. But you see, this is where sci-fi movies kind of start to merge a little bit with the smartphone technologies of today. Um, I'm looking forward to it. I don't know about you guys, but I'd always love to hear your thoughts. Do let me know on Twitter. We are at Tech News Gadget or wherever else you happen to be listening to today's episode. Uh, But yeah, there's Apple for you. All right, moving right along to our next story. And by the way, I know you guys wonder from time to time, hey, is there a place I can go to get the show notes of today's episode? Well, there is. Head on over to technewsgadget.net, and uh, you can actually get the show note links directly right from there. I know some of you guys want to double-check sources or look at the articles for the images or the videos that it might contain. So I actually put that in there for your benefit, and uh, um, just so that you don't have to worry about looking around or trying to figure out if I'm making stuff up or just reading from a script. Uh, Sometimes I do. Um, the reading from a script is an article and the other script is the stuff for the show but uh, yeah no I'm not making this stuff up and I like to uh, kind of include you guys in the news that I'm reading from the day to day and uh, kind of saving you from 
having to actually do it yourself because there's a lot of news flying all over the internet all over the time uh, for tech and gadgets, but it's hard at times to find the best, and I do work hard to try and find interesting, fun articles worth reading and sharing. So uh, this one is, well, I guess it doesn't uh, pay to um, steal iPhones. This one is um, coming to us from Apple Insider. He said to add Amazon employees arrested for stealing $592,000 worth of iPhones. Now, uh, it goes on to say a group of five Amazon employees have been arrested for allegedly stealing iPhones from a logistics center in Madrid, Spain, in an operation that is believed to have involved a theft of 500,000 euro in goods, which translate to 592,000 U.S. Uh, dollars. The arrests were made following an internal investigation by Amazon itself, discovering there were issues with some packages sent to customers due to having differing weights from what the actual order was supposed to weigh. The detected differences prompted Amazon to install hidden cameras to find out what was happening. They then determined a group of workers was, were slipping new iPhones like the iPhone 12 and the 12 Pro into orders secretly, replacing the actually ordered contents of a package at the last moment. Um... It believes the orders were placed by an accomplice. Three of the five people implicated in the theft ring were arrested on leaving work. A fourth was picked up while working, and a fifth turned himself into police voluntarily. All five have then been consequently fired by Amazon R and R awaiting trial. Uh, man, it the workers were found to have ten iPhones in their possession, intended to be dispatched out using the same method. They're also carrying a large number of stickers with IMEI numbers seemingly torn from boxes to hamper the investigation. Further arrests have not been ruled out with investigations continuing to determine where the dispatch phones ended up. It's estimated half a million euros worth of devices were stolen by the group. Um jeez. Yeah, uh so don't don't work at a warehouse and think you can get away with stealing stuff because they will find you and um you will be uh awaiting trial and and likely facing some jail time so just don't do it it's not it's not worth it it's not worth it if you're looking for something fun to do play video games uh and then outside of that if you are so inclined uh, start a business have fun um investing stock markets do something th now don't don't ever go to stealing. I'm just going to say that generally for whatever line of work you're in. Uh, don't steal, especially when you can just get caught. I mean, oh, well, I don't know what's happening with the iPhones. I mean, like the shipment was supposed to weigh this much and it's not. And something's going on. And then we connect the dots and oh, look, hand caught in a cookie jar. Honestly, I just had to share that for a little bit of a laugh. All right, heading on to some gadget news. Google is debuting the new Barely Blue Limited Edition color for the Pixel 4a. And I know to some of you, you're all excited by all of this. And some of you aren't all excited. And some of you are like, well, I might be interested. Why would I want to get a different color phone? Well, the Google Pixel 4a is a great phone at a fantastic price. Perhaps the only drawback was a limited color palette. As the old Ford Adage goes... Um, and I just murdered the word, but whatever. You could have it in any color you want, so long as it's black. Well, that changes now as Google is debuting a new limited edition barely blue colorway for the Pixel 4a on sale starting today. And yes, there are images that goes along uh, with this. Uh, link is in the show notes. Otherwise, if you're watching via YouTube, you can actually see on screen what we're looking at right now. It looks nice. Nice, simple blue color. In typical Google fashion, excluding last year's Halloween-themed Pixel 4, the new color is an understated pastel-like shade encompassing the entire plastic body and fingerprint sensor, only lightly saturated to match that barely blue name. A barely darker shade of blue offsets the Google logo, further accented by what looks like an orange power button similar to the Panda Pixel 2 XL or Flesh Tone Pixel 3. The muted color combination is perfectly in keeping with that Steers Pixel 3a, which came in a similarly low-key purplish colorway. We haven't had a chance to see this new shade in person yet, but it's pretty hot in a googly sort of way. We don't know how limited the new color might be, but Google is selling it for the same $349 price tag as the previous boring black version. Sales open at 10 a.m. Pacific today, roughly when this post went live. And 
uh, as per when this podcast episode releases. It's been out as of today. This isn't the first time Google has lim- done a limited edition color for a Pixel, and seeing as how the Pixel seems to be doing well, um, and if you're looking for an Android to get into and own, um, Pixel is the way to go. Last year's Pixel 4 was available in a limited edition, also orange colorway, which came back in stock a handful of times, but ultimately remained harder to get than the standard black and white colorway. So, obviously, if you want a, a rarer colored phone, now's your chance to hop on, especially if you're looking for the Pixel for a upgrade. So, yeah. Figured I'd uh, share that quick tidbit of news with you. All right, moving on to some more articles, but uh, <laughs> I do got to say, if you guys are um, interested in the video of today's show, head on over to youtube.com forward slash tech news gadget, and there I'll make sure the video is available for you to watch in full. Um, <laughs> but this article comes to us from Newser, um, and it says, New Video Games Research Offers a Twist. How's this for a conversation starter? If you play Animal Crossing for four hours a day, every single day, you're likely to say you feel significantly happier than someone who doesn't. The assertion to the BBC comes from Oxford researcher Andrew Shabilsky, who is quick to add, that doesn't mean Animal Crossing by itself makes you happy. Then led to what his team builds as a first-of-its-kind study into two all-ages video games, namely Animal Crossing and Plants vs. Zombies battle for neighborville per an oxford release their main takeaway takeaway playing the games is associated with greater happiness and well-being uh shabilsky says that it's interesting in part because it generally flies in the face of years of research about video games and i just gotta laugh at this point because i mean honestly for those of you listening or watching this show who are young enough to understand and who have been around video games long enough to understand, or even a little bit older than me because video games have been around for quite a while. Now, I don't know. I was an 80s kid, uh, late 80s kid, so I grew up obviously in the 90s, uh, but the 80s still holds true as well. But, like, we know video games is... uh, In moderation video games are good for you they're a great stress reliever they don't drive you crazy uh, unless you're throwing a fit over a video game match that you were expecting to win and you weren't it's just this is when you just back off and you say okay it's just a game i'll do better the next round i'm not going pro unless you are pro then you kind of are beating yourself up over different reasons and you're actually getting paid to beat yourself up um just, you know, improve your gameplay and get better at it. But, like, uh, it goes on to say our findings show video games aren't necessarily bad for your health. In fact, play can be an activity that relates positively to people's mental health, and regulating video games could withhold those benefits from players. The study is noteworthy because it might be the first based on actual playing time of more than 3,000 gamers supplied by the game makers, as opposed to previous studies relying on players' own notoriously inaccurate estimates per The Guardian. If nothing else, Shabilsky says he hopes this will raise the bar for future research and perhaps point to aspects of games that aren't so beneficial. As for why these particular games might help well-being, researchers aren't sure, but Shabilsky noted that both have social features in which players interact with one another like a digital water cooler. And I I think this sums up the point. Video games are fine. They're a great stress reliever. They're a way to help you improve muscle, hand-eye coordination, get better at developing patterns, puzzle solving, enjoying life from time to time, the social aspect of being able to hang out with random people from all around the world simultaneously. You don't actually have to be in in the same room to enjoy a video game. I, I mean, the benefits are endless. It, it just keeps going on. But in moderation. But at the same time, we already knew all of this stuff. It's just we have to sit there and listen to the news and listen to older generations tell us video games are bad. Oh, they're horrible. They're wrong. You don't like them. They're bad and they're horrible. They're mean, nasty, and bad and horrible. And you should never play video games. And we're all like, 
okay, I understand. You didn't grow up with video games. We, however, did. We've figured out in moderation to the best of our abilities, and hopefully that holds true for you as well, listening, uh, to find ways to enjoy a video game, to take the stress off, to uh, improve whatever you're trying to improve, whether it's pattern recognition, puzzles, memory retention, uh, hand-eye coordination, if you want to become a pro uh, and, and, and join a team or you're part of a team and you're trying to get better. You know, all of this stuff, it all, it all works. But uh, too much of a good thing can be bad for you, obviously. And obviously, depending on the type of games that you play, could could be bad, but it, it, take it with a grain of salt. It's just generally games. But if you're not going crazy, it's likely fine. And it's probably what we've been telling our parents or par uh, people in, the, in older generations. Video games are fine. They're okay. They can be good for you. I just don't go crazy. on. <laughs> I mean, honestly. Like, I, is, there, is there much more I need to explain here? You kind of get the gist. Okay. That's what I thought. Oh, something's in my eye. I don't know what it was. I don't know. Anyways, I know you guys are interested in um, podcasting, right? If you have a podcast app and you're interested in uh, listening to the show via podcasting, uh, you can actually do that. We're available on any podcast platform. You can hit the subscribe button. You can actually get the show notes right there. And uh, a little secret, you can actually get the direct links to the articles right in the show notes on the app you're listening in without ever having to go to technewsgadget.net. Saves you a whole bunch of time. You can actually click on the link. It'll take you right to where you wanted to go. You can see the pictures, the article, the video, everything that goes along with it. So if you're considering subscribing via the podcast, do it today. Sorry, I had to channel a little Palpatine for you, but... This article comes to us from CNET, and it says Android and iPhones are all about privacy now, but startup Osam thinks it can do better. Now, the team behind Andy Rubin's Essential is back, this time without Rubin. Now called Osam, it plans to introduce a new privacy-focused hardware and software in late 2021. It all started with two trips to China. The first, in August 2019, brought Jason Keats to Hong Kong, um, just as some events started happening on in the... Uh, in Hong Kong area, the head of R&D for the once buzzy startup Essential Products was there to work on the company's upcoming Project Gem, an eye-catching new smartphone with an unusual skinny design. The second was in January. Keats was back in China finishing up Project Gem, a project ultimately doomed by Essential's controversy-plagued founder. While essentially Essential is no household name, its founder, Andy Rubin, is revered by smartphone aficionados as the father of Android. His reputation drove the quick rise of the startup, but the poor response to its debut handset and the outcry over other allegations uh, regarding Rubin sparked its similarly rapid demise. But for Keats, his work on Project Gem and those trips to China on behalf of Essential proved to be a critical catalyst for something else. His first trip gave him a taste for the need for privacy on devices, as a colleague faced interrogations about what was on his phone when they passed from Hong Kong into mainland China. The second showed Keats that while Essential was over, his ambitions to produce a high-end device were not, and so his next endeavor, Osam, was born. This time, it was all going to be about privacy. Essential had 80% of a great idea, Keats said in one of three Zoom video interviews with CNET over the past month, but we needed to come up with what really brought that last 20%, a focus on something. We're focused on a singular vision in terms of what all our products are going to be, and we are bringing a whole suite of products to market. Keats has brought some of the Essential team over to Osam. Notably, that doesn't include Ruben. Essentials are past, Osam's are future, and he's not involved in any capacity, according to Keats. OSAM, which stands for Out of Sight, Out of Mind, isn't trying to recreate Essential or release the devices the former company never finished. In fact, it isn't ready to talk about what specific products it plans to build, but it does have a very clear mission, giving us more control over our data. It plans to do that through a combination of hardware and software, with more than half a dozen products arriving over the next several years. Everything we're doing is built around privacy, uh, says Keats, who, along with founding OSAM, serves as a CEO. 
It's really about giving people a choice. Right now, there's no choice on who private information is shared with and how, and we want consumers to own their privacy and own their data. Now, uh, yeah, when it comes to phones, there are main... Uh, there are two main privacy concerns. The first is what data your operating system or device maker collects on you. The second is what information the third-party apps you download are extracting and sharing, whether the OS outright allows it or not. Now, the latter is difficult to track. Apps can be dishonest about the data they collect, and it takes analysis of the traffic leaving your phone to understand what an app is truly doing. Now, seeing as how the European Union, California, the state of California have laws that allow consumers to opt out of having their data sold. Many times companies are still collecting information on you without ever letting you know, letting, let alone giving you control over where that data goes. Osam wants to change that. Its plan seems straightforward. It won't ever have access to that data to start with, kind of like with Apple. And when you want to share your data, it will make sure you know where it's going. Neither task will be easy. So, um, yeah, it's it, it's kind of... Interesting, uh, I got to say. We'll see where uh, Osam goes with this, seeing as how Essential imploded. The article goes on. Sorry, I just punched a microphone. So if you want to read more of the article, feel free to do so. But what I'm thinking here is this goes back to the whole privacy thing. Like what data needs to be absolutely private? And then what data is there that you just don't really care about? I mean, you've heard my arguments on on that before if you haven't listened to previous episodes where i talk about this uh or just hit me up on twitter or on our discord server um i don't know it i understand the value of it but in terms of other kinds of data i really don't care who has access to it and i think mainly that's the point i think that's when it comes to osam is they want to have it private by default but have you, the user, in control in terms of what data you share and with who. That I'm actually on board with. Like, obviously, there's private data that needs to remain private at all times, period. And then there's data where I don't necessarily know if I want it to be shared out publicly or, or sold or, or for third-party apps to know or other companies to know and share because then it just kind of gets annoying because then you get like spam calls off of it or something. Who knows what happens with it. But then there's data that I don't care about. So maybe you could say for me, I'm not sure how you would line up if this would be somewhere different or you'd be along the same lines. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I'd love to have a conversation uh, more longer term. But I seem to figure out there's three buckets. There's the private data that should remain private. There's data that should, well, it could go either way. It should remain private or not. Uh, but I should maybe have a choice over that data if I want it to be shared or not. Uh, and then there's the third container, which is data filled with, I don't care who knows. It's not really that relevant, like a Google search. Pfft. Who cares? There you go. Out in the world, uh, a, a search for a brand on, on Facebook. I don't care. Data, anybody could, who cares? So those are my thoughts, but I will leave the rest of this article up for you guys to read at your leisure and head on over to the next article. All right. Now I know what most of you are thinking, especially in the Mac world, you're all excited and, and I'm Definitely impressed when it comes to the new Apple Silicon line of computers, um, especially with the M1 processor. But uh, the claim that Apple made, not really holding a lot of water. Sorry, but the new MacBook Air is not faster than 98% of PC laptops. Now, I know what you're saying. Taylor, I can see it right now and where this article is from. It's from PC World. It's biased. It's garbage. or lying. Okay, before you guys all start the whole... I'm a Mac and I'm a PC argument. Just listen to the argument with a grain of salt. Make your own decisions. <laughs> the article goes on to say, let me just say it out loud, okay? Uh, Apple might be full of it, uh, referring to Apple's claim that its uh, fanless ARM-based MacBook Air is faster than 98% of PC laptops. Yes, you read that correctly. 
Apple officials literally claim that the new MacBook Air using Apple's custom M1 chip is faster than 98% of all PC laptops sold this year, this year being 2020. Now, typically when a company makes such a claim, it publishes a benchmark, a performance test, or actual details on what it's basing that marketing claim on. This is namely to prevent lawyers from launching up missile silos across the world and then having lawsuits flying around over the place. It gets a lot of fun. Uh, Believe me, Apple's website then restates the claim by stating the M1 is faster than the chips in 98% of PC laptops sold in the past year, so 2020, 2019, around there. The site also includes a detail note that states testing conducted by Apple in October 2020 using pre-production 13-inch MacBook Pro systems with M1 chips and 16 gigs of RAM, performance measured using select industry standard benchmarks, PC configurations from publicly available sales data over the last 12 months, performance tests are conducted using specific computer systems and reflect approximate performance of MacBook Pro. It's in a, it's in a small little lettering, and if you're wondering, get this out of here um there it is highlighted for you um so it kind of gets weird at that fine print part you see not only does apple not say what test is basing its claims on it doesn't even say where it sources the comparable laptops does that mean the new fanless macbook air is faster than say the asus's stupidly fast ryzen 4000 based geforce rtx 2060 based Zephyrus G14? Does it mean the MacBook Air is faster than Alienware's updated Area 51M? The answer I'm going to guess is no, probably not at all. Is it faster than the mini LED based MSI Creator 17? Probably not either. And what is that performance claim hinged on? CPU performance? GPU performance? Performance running Windows? Is it running the same applications running on both platforms? Is it experiential? Is it running Red Dead Redemption 2, Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War? Is it running Cyberlink's Power Director? Is it running Fortnite? No idea what they're basing the claims on. Um, but uh, 98% sure that any of the above named laptops listed will wreck the MacBook Air doing any of the tasks just named. Now when Apple makes his claims, my guess is that they're comparing the new M1 to the Intel-based processors ranging from the Atom to the Celeron N to the Core i3 and up all with integrated graphics. But by not defining the word performance, all this becomes just pure marketing spin. Is it really fair to compare a $1,000 MacBook to one that costs $150? Because $150 PCs are included in the 98% of laptops sold. Maybe Apple should compare its own $150 MacBook Air against a $150 Chromebook or a Windows-based laptop. Of course, then we might have, uh, you know, apples and apples to compare against. Um... No doubt the M1 will be impressive, but I do think uh, it's going to compare to 8 cores of Ryzen 4000 performance or a GeForce RTX 2060 and beat it. No. No. <laughs> but, yeah. So, are you still getting the Apple, the new one? If you are, I mean, I understand. I understand. It's perfectly fine. Just take it with a grain of salt. And for PC users, take it with a grain of salt. I mean, we all have our own preferred machines that we prefer to use. Either we've grown up with it or we're used to it or we like the brand or we like the customer service or we like the features. We all have our own specific reasons. Um, in my household, I'm very firmly a PC guy and my wife, ironically, is a Mac uh, person. So <laughs> to each their own. And, and it's only because of what we each grew up with so let me know if you're a mac pc user i'd love to continue the conversation because obviously the podcast can only go for so long well episode wise all right wrapping up today's show wanted to kind of share a tidbit of new technology that bean sound beaming i know it's kind of interesting uh, there's this new sound beaming technology claiming it can broadcast music to your brain without headphones. Um, it's called Sound Beamer 1.0, developed by Novetto Systems. Product reportedly creates a personal sound bubble that allows you to hear 3D audio while continuing to observe other sounds in the space. It's it, interesting. Um, it's apparently difficult to explain this magical technology sound. Um <laughs> Uh, so the AP interviewed Novetto CEO, uh, 
Christoph Ramstein, and he said, I don't know, man, it literally just zaps your brain with sound waves that no one else can hear. The brain doesn't understand what it doesn't know. Um, it, it, it's interesting, uh, that much I will say. Um, according to Novetto, the product's sensing module locates and tracks your ear position, creating sound pockets in your ears by sending ultrasonic sound waves. You can program the bubble to move with you or stay in one place. The sound is available in stereo or 360 degree spatial 3D mode. Um, here's the interesting part. This is an actual product coming out. Um, they're expecting to release a version of the Sound Beamer in time for Christmas 2021. Not this year, next year, 2021 by which point the technology would almost certainly have been exploited as a weapon for psychological warfare by defense and intelligence industries across the globe. Okay, outside of the sci-fi and dystopian future genres, pretty interesting. Who's going to need headphones anymore? Think about that. Pretty interesting. And is the sound bubble able to be heard by others, or is it just like exclusive to you? Definitely interesting technology. Oh, they got a video that goes along with it? No way. What does it say? Are you listening? Introducing sound beaming. You hear the audio, others don't without headphones. And that's all I'm going to tease. So if you are interested in reading more, this article is by Boing Boing. So I will have a link to it in the show notes. And with that being said, that wraps up this episode in the latest in tech news. Thanks for tuning in. The latest in tech news can be found on every major platform, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever else podcasts are found. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to let us know by leaving a review and by sharing this episode with a friend. Also, double check that you are subscribed so that you don't miss the next episode. I'm your host, Taylor Merrick, and remember, for the latest in tech, gadget, and gaming news, visit technewsgadget.net. Pretty much keeping awesome, guys, and I'll see you on the flip side.